Luke Gervasi has been a project ecologist with GEI Consultants at the, their Huntington Station office since August of 2019. Before that, Luke served as the LISMA Field Projects and Outreach Coordinator. Luke is another graduate of SUNY ESF with a bachelor's in aquatics and fisheries science with a minor in marine ecology and also SUNY Oneonta with a master's degree in lake management. Luke's master's thesis and research were focused on writing a comprehensive lake management plan for the Mill Site Lake Property Owners Association in Redwood, New York. Luke is a licensed aquatic pesticide applicator in Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York. He has experience working on lakes and ponds throughout the Northeast, surveying for invasive species in the aquatic and terrestrial world, lecturing for a variety of groups, and Luke has a particular passion and interest in aquatic vegetation and fisheries management. So welcome, Luke. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. I uh, also would be remiss not to say that I got a good laugh before when you said the Lisma TikTok was on fire. I never thought I'd hear <laughs> it was on fire. <laughs> um, it's really exciting, though, to get that many views and that many followers so quickly. It's uh, that's really exciting. So it's it's good to see. Um, hello, everyone. It's good to see all of you and kind of hear some familiar voices. Um, you know, hopefully we can be having these meetings in person uh, pretty soon. You know, it'd be nice to, to have a beer with everybody and, you know, to catch up a bit. Um, so just want to say, you know, thanks for, for welcoming me back. I'm sure a lot of you are probably tired of hearing my voice for lectures sometimes. Um, but this is one that, you know, I definitely really enjoy um, giving. And it's kind of, you know, one of my, you know, main passions, uh, especially considering my background work. So thanks again, everyone, for, for having me here. A uh, quick intro for those who, you know, do not know me or may not be familiar. Um, as Bill mentioned, I, I spent my uh, undergraduate time at SUNY ESF, uh, you know, going there for aquatics and fishery science, where I really just was only interested in playing with fish, um, but then it kind of morphed into a full, you know, ecological scale um, education, you know, and I got really interested in how all these plants and everything interacts within freshwater bodies. Um, I just want to say that now too, that this talk is going to be mainly focused on freshwater aquatic um, species, not, not marine. Um, then I spent time at SUNY Oneonta in the lake management program there. I've also spent time interning or working uh, seasonally with DEC or the New Jersey DEP. Uh, in about another two years as an aquatic biologist with the Pond and Lake Connection, which is a pond and lake management company um, out of Connecticut, but we did work throughout the tri-state area. And as Bill mentioned, um, about two years as well as the field projects and outreach coordinator with LISMA, which I was very grateful for that time to get to meet most of you um, while I was there. Anybody know what kind of fish this is right here? I give permission to unmute yourself and interrupt. All right, so it's um it's a snakehead. Uh, this was actually found right in Queens, um, kind of close to City Field, actually, right by um, oh boy, I can't remember the name of the park now. Um, but close to City Field, right in Flushing, the lakes are called Willow and Meadow Lake, I believe. Um, but you know, just I know most of you probably heard about snakehead before, and they are within Lismont. They are here, so. Um, just something I usually like to go over quick whenever giving this talk, you know, especially if it's for an audience that's not um, as educated or maybe specialized with invasives as we all might be. It's just to really go over the definition of what an invasive species is. Uh, I feel like sometimes it gets lost amongst folks. Um, just to go over it again quickly, you know, we're talking about non-native plants, animals, insects, uh, even pathogens that can cause harm to our environment, economy, uh, human health, etc. So a lot of these, some of us may be familiar with. Uh, there's a, a snakehead right there with teeth that just come right out of a horror movie. Um, also the ability to walk across the land if it's moist enough for a little while. So they're <laughs> pretty tricky. Um, giant hogweed and emerald ash borer, which obviously aren't gonna be the focus of uh, this, this talk today. Another thing I always like to talk about is kind of the difference between invasive, non-native, naturalized, um, particularly because there are there is an aquatic plant um, that the New York State has listed as invasive, 
However, it's actually native here on Long Island. Um, so it's one that kind of, you know, toes the line when it comes to the actual definition of invasive, non-native, naturalized, um, or what something native is to its environment. Also, if there are any questions throughout the, the talk, you know, please put them in the chat and I'd be glad to, to answer them uh, at the end of everything. And then again, an invasion curve, which I know, again, most of us are probably pretty familiar with, but, you know, going on to the whole idea, especially with aquatic invasives, it's a little bit more difficult to identify the submerged aquatic plant um, that you don't see while you're walking along a trail, you know, so that really becomes important to have this detection time, you know, and really find it at that point so that the prevention or eradication of the spread of the species is a little bit more feasible um, than when it gets here, like most aquatic invasives tend, tend to do, is because, you know, when you work in the aquatic environment, it's a more difficult environment to work in, unless you're, you're diving out there or you're doing all these, you know, surveys throughout, throughout the year. Um, like I said, it's just a little bit more difficult than walking along a trail or maybe walking through the woods and looking for these invasive species. So how do most of these invasives get here? Um, especially with aquatic spread, there are a couple of number, you know, a number of different ways that they can um, really get here. One of the major ones is really ballast water. Um, the St. Lawrence Seaway is really a hot spot for aquatic invasive species, considering how much boat traffic goes through the area with big, you know, um, big ships like this that come in. They collect water when they're in Europe or wherever else they might be to, you know, obviously maintain balance in the boat and make sure they don't tip over. Um, and then they would usually dump the water when they get to a new port, whether it be in St. Lawrence, uh, even areas of Brooklyn. Um, you know, there are new regs now where they actually have to dump that water from their original port um, out at sea and then recollect, you know, new water as they come in to prevent that spread. But there are a lot of species that have come into the St. Lawrence uh, River area and then spread into the Great Lakes or other water systems through that uh, through ballast water. Pallet wood and then obviously uh, firewood here is definitely more terrestrial focus as well as you know the nursery industry, but just you know another another method for some of these you know insects or other pests to spread. Um, in terms of the aquatic world, you know, hitchhikers on boats. I know it's a big thing that the DC pushes with um, with promotional information, and rightfully so. You know, it's just basically ballast water, but on a smaller scale. You know, even live wells or a little puddle in the bottom of a, a boat of this size can transport you know invasive eggs, uh, larvae of stuff, especially zooplankton. Um, spiny water flea is something that's you know becoming quite a big issue. Um, and then obviously the plants. You know, I mean this. This does happen. I mean, who actually cleans off, you know, before all this great educational awareness would clean off every single thing off of their boat trailer. I, I know most people wouldn't do it. Um, and serving as a boat steward, it would happen occasionally where I'd have to, you know, tell people you got to clean that boat off, even if you're leaving the lake that I'm inspecting. Um, so it is a, a very good way for, good way for these species to spread, um, especially with kayakers, canoers, fishermen, etc. And then lastly, we have aquariums. You see, I have my, my planted tank behind me, um, you know, and it's kind of funny how these things spread. I mean, red ear sliders are definitely a, an animal that is spread based on aquarium releases, um, as well as a number of plants that I'll get to in a little bit. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures I've ever seen. I saw it, uh, someone sent it to me. They were giving a, a talk for a conference and had this picture in it. And I said, I need to, to see this um, so that I could use it in the future because it's just a, such a good example of there's blue aquarium gravel <laughs> on this lake edge. And how else is that blue aquarium gravel getting there besides someone taking their tank down and just dumping it? You know, I mean, there are examples of this happening, I believe in the Carmen's River. We think that Cabamba or Fanwort, which is another plant I'll get to later today, um, how it was introduced into that system. So it's just, you know, it's a very good way for these plants to spread um, or goldfish. That's not, you know, another one right there that a lot of people think they're doing the right thing by, you know, keeping this, this organism alive and releasing it into the wild for it to live its, you know, its life. Um, but it really is doing more harm than good uh, in the end. So we will get into some of the plant ID now. Um, this is something that can go a while, but I'll try to be as quick and thorough as possible as I can while going through this. Um, 
There are things that I like to go over though, before we really get into the plants. I know there are a lot of terrestrial folks on the call. Um, so the way I like to think of this is, you know, I know tree ID as well. So let's kind of use the things that we would use for tree identification when it comes to these aquatic species. So let's talk about the environments that they might live in. Um, can everyone see my mouse too as I move it around? Just give me a thumbs up if you can. Thanks. You know, we have this interface here of terrestrial plants and then the littoral zone, which is any of the plants that I'll be talking about, they occur within this littoral zone. No aquatic plants can grow uh, past the limnetic zone, which is an area where basically sunlight doesn't reach. So there are some plants that specialize in getting, you know, low light and they could reach the top. We have our emerged plants right here or emergent plants, floating plants, so they're rooted um, and then obviously have floating leaves. And then our submerged plants, you know, so when you're IDing these plants, it's important to know, all right, let's start off. Is it an emergent, floating, submerged? Um, what are we looking at? You'll probably hear me use macrophytes or aquatic plants interchangeably throughout the day, uh, throughout the day, throughout the talk. So it's their interchangeable. Macrophytes just means aquatic plants. Um, and just to give an example of some that are emergent, floating and submerged and you know native and invasive counterparts. Um, arrowhead here is a beautiful native plant that you can see it's, it's growing, it has roots in the water, but it's emerging out of the water surface. So when we refer to emerging, that's what we're talking about. Um, purple loose strife, which I know most of us are familiar with here, especially Steve. I know uh, we did a lot of work with it on the Peconic uh, with some hand pulling. Then we have our floating leaf plants. Um, they can be rooted in the sediment and some are just free floating. So there is a difference with that. If you wanna use that diagnostic feature while trying to ID some of these, if they're free floating or they're rooted in floating. Um, so here's our native spatter, spatter dock or cow lily and then invasive water chestnut, which I'll get to in a little bit. And I know we spoke about quite a few times so far in the call. And then our submerged plants, which we really get to, you know, those are our submerged aquatic plants um, that majority of what you'll see in a pond or a lake are submerged plants. Um, coontail is a, a native plant that I've actually seen sold in pet stores now, which is kind of encouraging um, to see it used in, in aquariums uh, to be sold, as opposed to invasive hydrilla or Brazilian alodea, which I have seen in the past at pet stores. So it's, you know, encouraging to see that those things have been phased out. Then our floating leaf plants, um, you know, so again, water chestnut also qualifies as a floating leaf plant since its leaves are floating on the water surface. Spatter dock, white water lily, which is native. I'll get through the difference of how to ID these when they're not in flower uh, a little bit later on. Yellow floating heart is another invasive one uh, with floating leaves, as well as European frog bit, which if you've gone on the Peconic and you've ever paddled down it, you are familiar with European frog bit. <laughs> So again, kind of relating it back to the terrestrial ID or tree ID, you know, usually one of the first things I know I do when I'm trying to ID a tree is I look, is the tree alternate or opposite? Because I can eliminate a number of things right away. So the leaf arrangement of these plants, um, it's very important to kind of, you know, check those boxes when you're going through IDing these, you know, to determine is it basal, is it alternate, opposite, or even whirled. So the leaves are just whirled right along the stem of the plant. Types of leaves, same thing again, when you're IDing a tree, you would do this just as well. Is it a simple, undivided leaf? Is it forked? This is actually a coontail uh, leaf right here. So we have the main stem of the leaf coming out right here, and then you can see how it forks out like that. Um, is it feathered, which is very common of our myriophyllums or all of our water milfoils that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and then is it branched? You know, so it comes out, it forks a number of times and is branched out like that. There are really not many basal um, aquatic plants. The, as far as I know, there are no known invasives in New York State that have a basal arrangement. Um, usually any of the plants you'll see with this basal arrangement are eelgrass, um, not the marine kind, you know, the freshwater type. Uh, quillwort, which is actually pretty common. I feel like I've seen it quite a bit on Long Island, or uh, pipewort over here. So again, all have that basal arrangement while they're coming up. All right, so let's get into some of the specific plant ID. Um, I'm going to start off with some natives because I think, you know, I know how to ID the invasives is only so good if you know something you could compare it to, you know, so you want to be able to ID most of these natives as well 
to kind of distinguish between um, everything that you might see while doing these surveys or uh, coming out to look at some stuff. So first one I want to talk about is called CARA. Um, it is actually a macroalgae, so it's not truly an aquatic plant. Um, it is also known as skunk grass. It's a it's, uh, common name. It's pretty common throughout most of New York state. Um, it has this, this world arrangement right here. And very often you can kind of see, you know, little dots in it like that. But when you feel this plant, it feels almost abrasive and it smells. Let me tell you, like it, it definitely smells. It earns the name skunk grass. I've also heard it called musk grass. I mean, often you'll see it growing in just these big, big old clumps like that because it is a macroalgae. So it's not gonna have any roots or anything. It's just kind of free floating, usually close to the water surface. Um, and you'll see it and it has calcium growing on it. So you'll feel that it's very abrasive and you will feel it on there. And then always, you know, nothing like taking an aquatic plant and smelling it right away. Um, but that's a good way to ID this species here, which you'll probably come, you know, come across uh, while doing any aquatic plant surveys. Coontail, I've mentioned it a couple of times. Um, it is a native species. I've seen it grow pretty aggressively, even in, in you know, in our area, um, you know, to get to the point where it can be considered a nuisance. Um, it's called coontail because it looks like a raccoon's tail. Um, we've even heard it compared to a paintbrush as well. So if you imagine the, the end of the, the, the leaves right here, it looks like the tip of a, a wet paintbrush. Um, and then just showing the forked formation here of the leaves, um, it's very easy to mistake it for some milfoils um, or kabamba, you know, some other plants that we'll get to in a bit that I'll talk about those diagnostic features as we go on. Um, and how you can determine, you know, what you're actually looking at. So then just another picture here to kind of show what it looks like um, in the environment, you know, when you're looking at stuff. I'm going to open the chat here to, oh, yes, Flushing Meadows Park, that is it, thank you. <laughs> okay, now, uh, I'm sure most of us have heard of Eurasian water milfoil, it's probably one of the top you know, I'd say top five aquatic invasives within New York State. Um, it gets a lot of recognition and attention by uh, natural resource managers and for good reason. But there are native varieties. There are also other invasive varieties of it. Um, one of the more common ones you'll probably come across is the, is the northern water milfoil here. Um, and looking at this plant, the way I usually ID it is just kind of the formation of it in the water. When we look at the Eurasian one later, you'll be able to compare the differences and how this one just kind of looks, you know, it looks a little bit more frail. It's more open in terms of the leaf arrangement. Um, another key ID factor with it is the number of leaflets along the stem. So the native northern milfoil that we'd be looking at here has around 10 pairs of leaflets, but I've seen it get to 14 as well. Uh, Mitchell. Um, you know, so as soon as you get to 14, which makes it pretty tough to distinguish between uh, the Eurasian water milfoil, but the Eurasian usually has a lot more leaflets, excuse me, along the stem. Um, and just look at the comparison of the two. The northern water milfoil is just, it's a lot more space in between the leaflets. It's a lot more, you know, loose, I guess you could say, whereas Eurasian is more dense and just, you know, it almost looks heavier, I guess is the way you could put it. Um, there's also a variable leaf milfoil, which I don't think, yeah, I don't have it in this presentation. Um, that is the one that is technically native on Long Island, but is considered invasive um, in the rest of, of the state. So there are quite a few, you know, plants within the Muriophyllum genus, um, but these are probably the two that you'd be most likely to see. Bladderworts, uh, they are a carnivorous aquatic plant, which is, in my opinion, very freaking cool. <laughs> so they have these little bladders here that'll actually ingest, um, you know, little invertebrates. Um, and they also usually tend to float on top of the water. I know Steve Young has done a lot of work with um, some native bladderworts. I truthfully have a tough time distinguishing um, and speciating them unless I have a field book with me. Um, but most of the time you will see them, it'll be pretty clear because I have these bladders right here that are really tough to mistake. Um, there's nothing else that really will have, 
the bladders like that, except for one other invasive, which I'll get to later, but they have another key identifying characteristic that you, know, you can easily determine if it's bladder warts or that invasive. Um, they also have these bright yellow flowers. I believe there's a species that has a red flower as well, um, but not much else really would have flowers like this in this dense pattern. And then again, you know, you use the flower, you go to look at it, you see it has the bladders on it, bladder work. Very cool uh, group of plants. Allodea is a very, um, another very common native plant that you'll probably see if you go out to do any, any aquatic plant surveys. Um, I love this picture of it zoomed in. It is a world plant, so the leaves are whirled around the stem right here, and it's usually has three leaves around the stem. That is a very important thing to know because there are two invasives, um, hydrilla and Brazilian allodea, that look nearly identical to this at first glance, but if you use those diagnostic features of there's three leaves along the stem, um, and it is a smooth leaf, not serrated, you'll be able to ID this uh, no problem compared to some of the other invasive ones. Same thing when you do when IDing trees, look at the form of the plant. Just kind of, you know, get familiarized with what it looks like. Because um, there are other plants that we'll look at that are, they're bushier too. They just look much, much bushier um, than the Allodea here, the native one that we got. So again, world leaves, three leaves along uh, the one world along the stem here. Also invasive in Europe now, which is you know interesting to always talk about the back and forth of our natives are invasive elsewhere. Potamogetans. Um, this could be an eight-hour lecture <laughs> on its own when we talk about pond weeds. Uh, any anything that is referred to as a pond weed is in the Potamogeton um, genus. And I have here the biggest thing: midrib, midrib, midrib. That is what defines this um, family of plants, aquatic plants, um, all of them have midribs along the leaf. And when I'm talking about that, what I mean is if you look down here, you can see that the fine midrib right down the middle of the leaf um, here as well. And another one that, you know, uh, this pond weed here, it often grows like this or just a shaggy, you know, dead leaves on most of it. And they're, I'm not gonna lie, they're very difficult to identify unless you, Again, use some diagnostic features like these unique flowers. So they'll produce, most pond weeds will produce these flowers later in the growing season. Um, and they really are the best identifying feature on pond weeds. Um, you know, here's another one here. I believe this is sago pond weed that look how thin this leaf is. It's very difficult to kind of make out the midrib on that. Um, but if you have a little, you know, magnifying glass in the field, it's easy to, to find out. And it has a characteristic Potamogeton uh, flower at the top here. Again, just they're very, very difficult to identify. Um, luckily though, for our purposes in terms of invasive species uh, network, there's really only one invasive pondweed that we would be concerned about. So again, just showing up a, you know, a more uh, closer picture of the, the pondweed in the top left over there. You can see that midrib in all of the leaves here, um, even some of the dead ones down here, it's still really defined. Um, and that midrib will give away that it is a, a potamogeton or a pondweed species. There is one that I wanted to go over in particular because I know it's pretty common on Long Island, especially in the Peconic River. Um, and it's called the ribbon leaf pondweed or potamogeton epihydrus. Um, and this one tends to prefer flowing water. As you can see, you know, the leaves are getting really dragged along by this, uh, this flowing water here. It has dimorphic leaves, meaning that it has two types of leaves, which are pretty common with the pond weeds. So some will have submersed leaves like this, and then the floating leaves with it as well, which is a good way to kind of ID it, you know, if you were to ever see it in the field. Um, and then again, this characteristic flower, which when you're IDing any of these pond weeds, which you, you would probably come across quite a few of them, um, the flower really is, it tends to be the best way to ID them. That's what's on all the field guides, you know, and um, the Congress keys that you might use to ID these, these plants. Again, very common on Long Island. I believe it's in the Carmens as well, but I know for a fact it's in the Peconic. Um, eelgrass is one of my favorite aquatic plants. Um, so here's our, our one basal arrangement plant. 
if you look here, you can see these leaves. I know it looks like there's a midrib right here, but these leaves don't have a midrib. Okay, so it looks very similar to a lot of pond weeds. Um, if you're looking at just this picture on the right here, but there is no midrib. So it's a way to distinguish it between pond weeds or something else. That and it has the basal arrangement. That should be a, a you know a dead giveaway that it is a pond weed. Um, and when these flower, I think it's one of the coolest things. They get this little squiggly stem that goes up um, and forms these white flowers that you might see on the water surface. So here's a nice picture illustrating that where you just see these squigglies, you know, coming out of the water. Um, and it's really unique looking, really cool. So this is a truly great plant to have in a system um, and just definitely interesting and something that you probably come across. But again, stressing the fact that it has no midrib and, you know, getting, you know, just dealing with it. it's not a pond, not a pond weed, we don't have to worry about the, that genus. Water stargrass, um, it's another unique plant that I've really only come across uh, in upstate New York. I haven't seen much of it on Long Island, um, but it's a very, you know, very unique one too. It really earns its name uh, for water stargrass because it has a star-shaped yellow flower and it looks like grass in the water. I mean, just quite frankly, it looks like it's just grass growing in the water right there. Again, I know a lot of people might pick this up and say, oh, it's a pond weed, you know, just let's lump it into that genus, but it doesn't have that midrib. So, you know, it's another key identifying factor when looking at a lot of these plants is midrib or not. You know, that should be one of the first things you determine to, to just throw out that Pona McGeaton genus um, while IDing these plants. And this one, you can see it has the main stem, and then just other branches coming off uh, with these simple leaves, and then the, the nice, pretty yellow star-shaped flower here. Um, that is, it's really cool to see when this is all flowering. There's just these yellow star flowers popping up right there in front of you. Uh, free floating, so let's get to some of these as well. Duckweed and watermeal. Uh, most people are probably pretty familiar with duckweed, I would think. Really cool plant, um, very tiny as well. You can see these are, this is a person's fingers right here. And you can see, imagine all those plants that are grown on that finger. Um, it is a free floating plant that has a little tiny root that actually uh, goes into the water and uptakes nutrients that way. This plant is, um, it, it can become a bit of a nuisance in slow moving systems like, you know, you know ponds and they usually, you know, conglomerate right in the corner of a water body. Um, can't really deal with fast flowing systems, but it you know might pocket in like a little pool area or something like that. Um, they'll actually drop down in the winter and then kind of go to seed that way and then pop up again in the spring when it's time to, you know, when things start to warm up. Um, and then water meal here is the world's smallest vascular plant. I bet you may have not known that. So that's a nice little fun fact about this plant. You'll often see these two together um, just because they prefer that same type of habitat. Um, and you can see how tiny this plant is. I mean, this is a person's thumb and they're you know, probably close to about a hundred little plants um, right here. So get more characteristic of you know, nutrient rich waters, slow moving um, pool areas and can't really deal with fast flowing or even you know, slight flowing streams or rivers. Let's get to our floating leaf plants. Um, so here are two that, if you've been on uh, a pond or lake on Long Island, you've probably come across the two of these. So we have our white water lily and spatter dock, otherwise known as yellow water lily or cow lily. Um, it's in my experience, it's most usually referred to as spatter dock. Um, and it's nice when they're in flower and you can say, oh, it's white water lily versus yellow water lily. Um, but you have to be able to ID it when it's not in flower as well. So the white water lily here, I always think of it because I usually have pizza on my brain. Um, it looks like it is a slice of pizza taken out of the leaf. So we have the pointed edges here and you can see how it kind of points out right there. It has that little the tip right there at the break in the leaf um, and has that triangle in there. Whereas the spatter dock, it's a, usually a very large leaf. I've seen them as big as about a foot long from, uh, from top to bottom here. And it is curved right there. Instead of coming out to that point, we have the little curve in the leaf right here, um, you know, and not a big divot in the middle of the leaf right there as well. And then one of the most interesting things with this plant 
is its root system. It looks like it's something out of a, a sci-fi movie or an alien movie. Um, you'll often see these kind of just floating at the top once they, they, they die or, you know, they're no longer viable. Um, and it looks very, very odd um, when you see it, but they have these, it's a very characteristic group um, that you can make sure to ID it as spatter dock and you'll know that it's that, that yellow water lily. Um, next is water shields, probably in my, my Mount Rushmore, a favorite aquatic plants. Um, it's pretty common on Long Island. It prefers acidic water. So I've seen a lot of it on Long Island and in the Adirondacks um, in some more acidic waterways. And the way you can tell this one apart from a number of our other water lilies, you can see you know, some lilies right here, is that water shield has the stem that goes right into the middle of the leaf. Um, you're not going to really see that in other, other lilies or floating leaf plants that you might come across. It's football shaped. I mean, almost always it's in that oval football shape right there. And if you touch the underside of the leaf, it is incredibly, incredibly slimy. Might sound gross, but you got to do what you got to do to ID stuff, right? Um, so again, it has that football shape and then this really interesting red flower here. You know, and I know I've mentioned at times that there are other plants with red flowers or other things with yellow flowers, um, you know, but it's one thing that you can put in your toolbox to ID that plant when you go ahead and look at, is it a floating leaf plant? Is it submerged? Uh, is it emergent, et cetera? Um, so this is one that if you go to do some surveys on Long Island or within the Lisbon territory, you're probably gonna come across pretty often. So again, stem going right to the middle of the leaf, football shaped and incredibly, incredibly slimy on the bottom of the leaf. Uh, let's get to our emergent plants. Pickerel weed is also another one of my, my uh, favorites here. I could see if you come across the flower how someone might mistake it for purple loose strife. Um, but when you look at the leaves and the growth pattern of everything, it's just, it's totally different. Um, they have a rancomous tissue similar to, to cattails or, or irises. Um, and if you look right here, it almost looks like an arrow, which I'll get to with arrowhead here, but I want to just compare the two back to back for a sec. Um, excuse me. The pickerel weed is more rounded. Um, it doesn't have that true arrow shape. And then you have the purple flowers here that bees love. I mean, whenever I come across this, there's always pollinators around it. Um, and there's quite a bit of it on the Peconic River as well. So very nice native. It's good to use in um, aquatic restoration projects as well, if you're doing some shoreline plantings or, or anything of that nature. Um, it's a very nice plant, beautiful flowers, and very effective uh, in a number of ways ecologically. The arrowhead, um, you usually see it in more of that terrestrial side, but it likes to get its feet wet for sure as well. Um, and again, just comparing the leaves, this is truly much more of an arrow compared to the pickerel weed here with that rounded lobe here at the base of the leaf. Um, you know, so you might come across this. I, I haven't seen it much on Long Island. I see it in some jobs for restoration sites where it's been replanted, um, but very nice native emergent plant that again, I'd recommend using in restoration projects as well. Um, blue flag iris is our native iris. Most of the iris you're probably gonna come across is yellow, which is the invasive variety. I truthfully, I don't know if anyone else on the call might know how, um, I don't know how to ID the blue flag from the yellow when they're not in flower. So if anyone could write that in the comments or, you know, uh, get into that maybe at the end of the presentation, I, I'd be all open to hear about it because usually what I depend on is the, the color of the flowers. Um, and quite frankly, I think the blue flag iris is a lot more pretty than the yellow. So we should be promoting that this is uh, planted in place of the yellow. And I've come across the yellow quite a bit. I know there's some in uh, Blydenburg Park um, as well as on the Peconic. So one thing that I like to show when talking about irises, um, when they're not in bloom, it's very easy to mistake them for cattails. They look very similar with the uh, leaves, you know, growing up to about a couple feet in height. Um, you can actually see cattails in the, in the back of this photo here. You see their flower back there, but the leaves look very, very similar again when either plant is not in bloom. So 
It's a good point from Andy that yellow tends to be very uh, rhizomatous, so it might have you know stronger rhizomes and roots uh, compared to the blue flag. So going back to the comparison of iris and cattails, you know it's very easy to mistake the, these two plants when they're not in bloom. And one key trick that I've always learned on how to ID them is the iris here on the left. You'll often see the plant arrangement. They come out. Imagine like overlaying your your fingers like that because they're coming out and just you know or even like a a couple of cards in your hand, you know, as they're kind of just spread out like that and overlapping on one another. Whereas a cattail um, typha genus, if you look at the base of the plant, it's one stalk. And it's going one stalk straight up. Um, I think it's a pretty clear, at least for me, I know that it's worked for me a number of times in the field, um, where you think of those, you know, fingers overlapping like that, or you have the cattail, that's that straight stalk growing up. Um, when they're in bloom, they're obviously very easy to tell apart. But when they're not, which is often what we run into in the field, um, this is a pretty good diagnostic feature to ID, to differentiate between the two. Drum roll for what we've all been waiting for. Uh, let's get into some of our invasives now that some of you might be a lot more familiar with. Um, just want to say as well, that's only scraping the surface on a lot of the native aquatic plants that you might come across. Um, I'll show, I'll share some ID books at the end of the talk, as well as my information. If you ever want to send me pictures of plants, I'm very used to it and encourage it. Um, so let's go ahead and get into the invasive ones now. How am I doing on time? It's 1150. I think it started what, like 1115 ish. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So you've got an extra 10 minutes or so afterwards after okay. Great. 12. Yeah. Um, okay, so I mentioned before that of the Potomagetans, uh, this pondweed genus, there's only really one invasive um, that is in this genus, and that is curly leaf pondweed. Something that a lot of us might be familiar with if you've gone out to Ponder Lakes um, and done some surveys. It's very common in most of New York State. Um, I know in the Catskills, it's a really big issue. I've seen it in a number of spots on Long Island as well. Um, and again, when we're looking at it, you see the midrib on all these leaves. So that's a key diagnostic feature of any plant within this genus. Um, you can see it here as well, down right here. Um, and the way that you can ID this plant, and it's pretty fail-proof, is think of lasagna or bacon. I swear I do not have food on my mind at all times, but it's a really good identifying feature. Um, when you see the, the crispy leaves you know, here, and how it, it looks like a lasagna shell or a, you know a piece of uh, fried bacon. And if you look in the background of this photo here, it almost looks like it is just uh, a field. You know, it looks like you could walk right across it. You can see how dense this plant grows. Um, and there is a feature of curly leaf pondweed that makes it very aggressive um, with its growth, and it is these turions right here. So it's a term for these little. Uh, features on the plant that you'll see here and how those things work. Oh, sorry. Um, you have this life cycle here where in the early spring, curly leaf pondweed will pop up. It can actually overwinter under the ice too. Um, so ecologically speaking, it can grow even with ice on top of the water. So as soon as that ice melts out, guess what's gonna be the first things that grow to the surface, blocking out any other you know, beneficial native plants um, and getting to the water surface right here. It's going to be curly leaf and sadly a lot of the other invasives that I'll talk about um, can overwinter like this and it's really crazy if you're doing some winter field work and you look under the ice and you see a green plant growing underneath the water. Um, so anyway, they produce these turions that they will end up actually dropping and it kind of acts as a fragment um, and can be viable within sediment for, you know, anywhere around five years to then just pop up again at any given point. You know, so as this plant's growing, it's really just dropping and producing these turions to, uh, to set itself up for the future. One thing that is very, very interesting about curly leaf is that usually by July 4th, mid-July, it's gone. It's all died off um, and you won't really see it anymore. But again, it has those turions that it drops to then pop up again in the winter, um, kind of lay low until, you know, it's skulking around, I like to say, on the, the bottom and waiting for its opportunity to grow back up. 
Um, and just, you know, ecologically speaking, an issue with that is all these plants die off in mid July or whatever. It's a very large nutrient input into that water body that can then lead to harmful algal blooms or provide nutrients to other, you know, aquatic invasives. Um, so this one is, it's a little bit of a, it's, it's a nasty invasive just because of those, those traits. Here are just some other native pond weeds um, that you might come across along the field. And again, you know, we're looking at that, the midrib, that's right there. You can see it there. Um, you might mistake it for white stem pond weed, but white stem, um, it has that white stem on it, it's, uh, named very appropriately. And even though it does have the somewhat crispy leaves, it's not anything like curly leaf right here. Uh, these leaves are much, much tinier than you would see on this white stem here. Clasping leaf, I've seen a number of spots on Long Island as well. Um, it's the only pond weed really that has a leaf that clefts entirely around the stem. Um, so it's a good way to ID it. It has some curl, you know, to the leaves as well, but with that clasping leaf, you shouldn't really mistake it um, for anything else. So again, there is our, our curly leaf. If you go out and do surveys, you will come across it in this area. Uh, next is my favorite, Eurasian water milfoil. So this is what was really kind of the focus of my thesis for Millsite Lake up in uh, Jefferson County. Um, and you can see here, you know, looking at this plant in the water now, if you recall back to my slide with the native one, is how much denser it looks in the water. You know, it's, there's not a lot of, of um, breaks in between it, you know, and it has that 11 to 21 leaflets per stem. Um, it also has this very unique flowering structure that you'll see kind of usually in August um, when most of these other plants are in flower. It's very unique looking if you're not familiar with aquatic plants and how they flower out like this. Um, here's an example of it in the field as well. And similar to curly leaf, I've seen this plant growing underneath the ice. Um, I've seen it in depths of 20 feet or more. So it could really deal with low light conditions. Um, and it is very, very well spread throughout New York State. Um, I know it's in a couple of the mill ponds on Long Island. Um, a lot of our major lakes, I believe it's in Lake Ronkonkoma. I don't think it's in the Peconic River. It doesn't really like river habitats all that much. It tends to prefer lakes. Um, but again, it gives that, has the same ecological advantage that crow leaf gets and that it could grow under the ice, be one of the first plants to really to sprout up um, once things start to warm up and then just outcompete everything uh, you know, else that might be in that water body. So again, feather leaf, 11 to 21 leaflets per stem, um, and it can grow by fragmentation. So a lot of these plants can grow by fragments where, you know, if you're going out there and hand pulling these plants and you leave even just that behind, that can grow into a new plant. So that's what makes these kind of very difficult to control is that if you go to those hand pulls, it might be doing more harm than good. Um, and then of course with boating, that's a very big thing where if a propeller goes through these plants, cuts everything up, you know, you're just creating more and more plants that are then gonna settle and then grow. Um, into new individuals and just keep reproducing and reproducing. So again, here's that comparison photo of the, you know, usually under 10 pairs of leaflets, but I've seen it get to 14, so it's not the best diagnostic, but you'll see with the Eurasian, it has a lot more, it's just a lot more dense with the leaflets um, along the stem compared to the, the native northern milfoil right there. Um, fanwort, this is a very common one on Long Island. Um, I feel like most of us down here and then even further south refer to it as kabamba and not fanwort. If you go upstate, you'll hear people call it fanwort. Um, so, you know, you should get used to using the two interchangeably between the common and the genus name here. Um, it is actually native in the southeast, but it's come up here and just kind of wreaked havoc on a lot of our waterways. The only thing you need to know for how to ID this one is that the leaves are not directly attached to the stem. They're actually, you know, there's another uh, branch right here that comes off of the stem and then the leaves grow right here. As far as I know, there's not another aquatic plant, at least a submerged aquatic plant, you will see that has that same growth pattern. You know, even if we went all the way back to coontail, it does have that other, you know, a secondary stem that's coming off the main stem, but all the plants are right along that stem and growing as opposed to this one that branches off like that and then grows on its own. 
Um, it's also branched. It's not forked just like the coontail. The coontail will only have that one uh, forked leaf there opposed to the branching here on Kabamba. White flower that sits just on the water surface is another key identifying factor. Um, do we know what this is now? These two plants that are right here. So we got duckweed and water meal, um, you know, that they can grow when all these invasives kind of come up to the water surface and just stop any water flow or water movement. Um, you know, so they contribute to the growth of other plants as well. So you'll see this white flower. I know if you go on the Peconic right by the DC boat launch on Edwards Ave, uh, when it's in flower, you'll look out and it looks like a field of these white flowers that are just popping up out of the water. And then Kabamba has another key identifying characteristic and that it has these dimorphic leaves. Um, these leaves at the top here, you'll see them. There's some right here in the photo that you can make out um, right there that kind of usually mid to late summer, they'll pop up these leaves and it'll just look like a, a weird cluster of these leaves attached to the plant um, that make it pretty easy to ID this plant along with the branching stem right here, um, you know, the flower. And then again, that dimorphic leaf right there, it's a uh, pretty tough to mistake. Um, this one also grows by fragmentation, um, most definitely an aquarium introduction. Um, you could imagine that it would look great in a fish tank just because it's how bushy it is and big, um, you know, so it would fit. I know it's been in the aquarium industry in the past, most likely how it was introduced to uh, a lot of our waterways up here. Very common on Long Island. You'll probably come across it while doing some surveys. Hydrilla, our <laughs> public enemy number one. Um, so here's our hydrilla, which you know I brought up the Aladea before when we were going through some of the native plants, and I love these pictures from invasives.org um, that show this you know really zoomed in um, area of the plant. And what I want you to take away when looking at this, comparing it to the Aladea before, is that these leaves are serrated. While it's very tough to see in the field without a little hand lens or magnifying glass, you usually can make it out. Um, if you hold it up, I usually hold it up to the sunlight. Um, and you can see those serrations right there. But another key factor with it, five leaves per whorl. You know, so the Aladea before, it had only three. It's five, so we don't have a 3D image, unfortunately, but you can see it has one, two, three right there, a fourth going in the back, um, and then our fifth leaf per whorl right here. It's also a lot bushier than Aladea, than what you would see, you know, with Aladea growing. You can see just, you know, it looks almost like a fir tree, um, just a lot bushier in the environment. And uh, it's quite a bit of a problem um, for us in New York State, as some of you may know. Um, one unique characteristic about it is that it has, similar to the turion I spoke about before with curly leaf pondweed, it has these things called tubers um, that are basically just starch energy sacs that they'll drop into the water and uh, they'll stay preserved and they can really sprout out at any, any time for a number of years and just continue to the growth of hydrilla. So even if you think you've eradicated it, it could pop up again three years later because there's these tubers in the sediment. Um, Rolling tubers in the sediment is a near impossible task. You'd have to either dredge the area or go out there and comb the entire sediment, which is a near impossible task when you're talking about the aquatic habitat. Um, just to again show how dense it could get on top of, you know, these plants will even grow to the water surface and then just grow laterally, which is really wild to think about uh, with how dense that it could get. Bald eagle, you may ask, why is a bald eagle here in an aquatic plant? presentation. Um, there's kind of a really scary situation going on um, relating to hydrilla and bald eagles, believe it or not, looking just the invasive species ecology of how this works. Um, there's a specific cyanobacteria, um, you know, these are the type of algae that contribute to harmful algal blooms that grows on hydrilla. So we have our hydrilla here. It's a symbiotic relationship where this type of algae which carries cyanotoxins, um, which are also in the news for a number of reasons, which could be another talk <laughs> in its own. Um, this algae grows specifically on hydrilla. There is a bird known as the coot that consumes hydrilla, um, which therefore 
also consumes this cyanotoxin. And once it bioaccumulates in the coot, um, it becomes more potent. And bald eagles are known to, at least in this area of the U.S. where this has happened, feed on, you know, maybe some dead coots, um, eat the coots. And then what was happening in a lot of bald eagles after this, there's a number of bald eagles dying randomly that people saw. And when, you know, folks looked at it, they noticed that the eagles were developing holes in their brain. They were literally turning into zombie bald eagles, um, you know, and this cyanotoxin was causing that neurological just disaster within their brains and putting, you know, making their brains look like Swiss cheese. Um, it happened in the southeastern U.S. where this, the accumulation of this neurotoxin just went up the food chain and, you know, caused a devastating effect on, on these, you know, birds of prey. So it's just something to consider when you're looking at these invasives. It's not just, you know, oh, I can't go fishing on my lake. I can't enjoy my lake. There's a big ecological, ecological cascade of what can really happen um, when these species are introduced. The next one is Brazilian Aladea, very, very similar looking to Hydrilla and our native Aladea. Um, the one big difference here though, four leaves per world. Um, it's also a lot bushier than our native Aladea. It'll look a lot more dense and kind of wide when you see it in the water. Um, it is not serrated though either which is how you can distinguish it from hydrilla um, and the aludea as well. You know, so these are both smooth, but hydrilla has those, the serrated leaves and the five leaves per whorl. Egeria here, the Brazilian aludea, four leaves per whorl. Um, here's a picture of it again, just showing how dense it can get right on the water surface. And you see it has those white flowers that are very similar looking to cabamba. Um, but we know if we were to go idea it, Kabamba has the main stem and leaf, you know, other stem branching out and the branchy, bushy leaves um, opposed to this, which is just leaves around the whorl of the stem. So again, knowing those diagnostic features, pretty important when trying to ID a lot of these plants. I believe the DEC or Agon Markets has made um, little ID cards. I think I've seen them in the Lisma outreach material before. Um, of just these three plants together because they are very, very easy to confuse in the field um, without looking at these diagnostics that are right here, you know? So the Allodea, um, again, three leaves per whorl. You can see it right here, has the three going around that stem. Uh, four right here on the Brazilian Allodea, and then five and the serration on the Hydrilla. It's obviously very important to, to remember that serrated leaf thing because sometimes you'll get a degraded specimen. There might not be the five leaves. There could definitely, you might find hydrilla with three leaves around it, um, but it might not be symmetrically dispersed like it is here. You know, it could be those three leaves right there or one, two, and then three, you know, where you could really kind of just picture in the five per whorl, um, you know, and then usually when you get a sample of it, you'll see a full stem, you know, you're not just getting that cross section of the leaf. Another thing I really like to do when trying to ID these in the field is I'll actually take a knife or even a scissor and cut the stem right there and just be able to look at, you know, this sample basically right here in this photo. Um, just look at the one whorl to try to determine, you know, what do we have here? Is it five, four, or three um, when looking at these plants? Come back to that. Um, so I mentioned before when we were talking about bladder warts, there's one, you know, one invasive that looks very similar and can be easily mistaken for the bladder wart, um, and that is water wheel. I believe in a number of, I think Steve Young, I think you spoke about it at the conference we put on a couple of years ago, um, you know, and how to ID this plant. It's, it has those very similar looking bladders right here. It's also carnivorous, um, really prefers acidic waters, which makes it a good invader for Long Island here. Um, slow moving systems, but compared to the bladder warts, it's, it's world, you know, the bladder warts are not world plants. Um, so you'll notice again right here, just looking at it, it's world along the stem. It has those the little, you know, very similar looking bladders or those carnivorous, uh, you know, features on it that you'd be able to ID it that way. Um, and last I've heard, I don't think there's been any documented on Long Island. I, I'd hate to hear that some has been here, but I know it's, um, very close. Um, I think it's in parts of New Jersey and the Catskills. Um, feel free to correct me if that's if that's incorrect. But 
another one to look out for that looks pretty similar to some of our natives. Floating leaf plants. Um, European frogbit, it's very, very common on the Peconic. It looks pretty similar to spatter dock, the leaves here, but they are so much tinier that you'll probably never mistake it for spatter dock because those leaves get, you know, nice and big, whereas these stay about the size of a baseball, maybe a softball. Um, and one way that you can ID these, this plant is that it is free floating. So the roots are actually not in the sediment. So if you pull on this plant, it'll, it'll come right up. Um, and then it has another, you know, white flower like this with the three petals, um, you know, that make it pretty easy to ID. If you would like to collect a specimen of it, it is in the Peconic River. Um, it's pretty widespread in there as well. So, you know, that's one that you can find pretty readily available there. But again, free floating, no roots actually within the sediment. So that's a good way to ID this plant here. Water chestnut, something that unfortunately a lot of us are probably pretty familiar with. Um, it has this rosette that it'll grow. It grows from these little nutlets in the bottom here that you can see in this person's hand. Um, it produces the nutlets here as well along the rosette. The leaves are kind of triangular shaped and have the serrations right here. Not really going to mistake this with anything else. Water chestnut is very, very distinguishable. Um, and it's clear once you get up close that it is water chestnut. It does have that white flower um, popping up in the middle here as well. Um, here's an image of those, the nutlets that it produces. Um, they, they hurt if you step on them. Um, in front of them puncturing boots, you know, puncturing skin if you step on it the right way. So what will happen is that these uh, nutlets here are produced on each of those rosettes and then dropped into the sediment once they're ready. And they can remain viable for, you know, around 12 years once they're in the sediment. Um, so even if you think you eradicate this plant, they could be lurking in the bottom, just waiting to pop up um, with it, its opportunity to come back, you know, and then these nutlets, what will happen is once they're, they're done, they, they're technically spent, you know, and then they'll float to the water surface and then go downstream. So if you go to Massapequa Lake and then go to the south, there's, um, there's a stream that flows out to a park right down there loaded with these, um, you know, the spent sharp nutlets that are a hazard to any children that might be running around, um, dogs. I know I don't want my dogs to step on, to step on one of these. I keep the vet in business enough as is. I don't need to, you know, go there for that. Um, so just a very unique, very odd looking uh, feature of water chestnut here. Um, and this is not the water chestnut that is edible that we, you know, often consume um, in a number of, of Asian dishes. Um, it would be great if we could make some recipes with this, but I probably wouldn't want to be eating this plant. Uh, water chestnut also has dimorphic leaves. So it has leaves along the stem that'll always be submerged in the water, but not floating on the surface. You know, so here are our floating leaves. Um, and then it'll actually, you can see some of the submerged leaves right there. They almost look like, they basically function as roots as well. They look like uh, just free roots in the water. Very similar, very similar looking to milfoil leaves, excuse me. Um, but you're not going to mistake it for milfoil because it has these, these floating leaves that are very characteristic of water chestnut. There is a second species that, again, as far as I know, hasn't been found in Lisma yet. Um, that's, uh, you know, another type of water chestnut. It's in New Jersey, um, as far as I know. But the nutlets only have two spines here as opposed to the four that you usually see on the one that's, that's more common for us and uh, quite a bit of an issue in our water bodies. So this is one to keep an eye out for. And the way you can really tell the difference between the two, again, is the two spines on the nutlet. Um, they usually have this reddish hue as well on the uh, stems coming out here. And then when they're still being produced, they're Kind of red in color like that opposed to this green that you might see here in the water chestnut. Um, just to give an idea of the eco you know, ecology of this plant and how it reproduces, each one of these rosettes produces about 10 nutlets per rosette. Any individual plant can have anywhere you know from one to about three rosettes. So one nutlet here 
can theoretically produce another 30 plants as it's going along. So just, I was told there would be no math today, so I'm not gonna do the math in my head. Um, but just when you think of it, if there's one plant in a water body, it can then produce 30 more. Those 30 can then produce another 30 of their own and, and so forth on that, you know, um, on that type of curve. The invasion of this plant is very successful and it can happen very, very quickly. There is good news about it though. Um, if you detect it for early on and you find it in a water body and you pull it before it drops those nutlets, that's it. There's no issue. It's gone. Um, it doesn't spread by fragmentation. It's an annual, so it doesn't, you know, uh, it's not a perennial or anything like that. So if you pull it out, you get it out of the water body, you're in good shape. However, once it drops those, those nutlets, um, you're talking about a multi-year issue. And there have been some success stories on Long Island with hand pulling and kind of really um, decreasing the numbers of this plant drastically. So this is one that that EDR curve, the invasion curve, is, is critical um, when you're going after this plant. Free floating ones, and I'm uh, pretty close to being done here. So I'll try to go through some of these quickly, just in the essence of time. Um, mosquito fern, it's uh, very similar in terms of function to duckweed and water meal, except it is um, the leaves are, are hydrophobic. So when you put water across them, the water will just kind of glisten right off of them. Um, and they're kind of bunched together like this, as opposed to the duckweed or water meal, which are just one individual leaf um, on the plant. Very crazy looking plant when it really kind of takes over. I haven't seen it in many spots on the island. Um, seen it in a couple of like private ponds and stuff like that. Um, but again, you can see that mat it forms right there. That's a, an inch or two thick on the water surface. Um, and I've actually used this plant in, in a, when I taught Gen Bio at Oneonta as a competitive example of, you know, how these different species interact and the competition between similar uh, aquatic plants. So this one, very unique looking. Um, it's very common in Florida and the Southeast US, uh, but it's one to keep an eye out for, especially in a lot of our ponds. Um, yellow floating heart is another invasive that you might come across. It's got a yellow flower with kind of like these frilly petals here along the side. Um, it could look very similar to water shield in terms of the size of the leaf. However, you can see the little the divot in the leaf here. Um, it's not that football shaped and it, you know, wouldn't have as slimy as a bottom as a water shield, you know, and that stem just not going truly in the middle of the leaf right there. This is another way to ID it uh, compared to some of our other natives. And lastly, some of the emergent plants. Um, I briefly touched on purple loose strife earlier. This is one that's becoming a little bit more common on Long Island um, that you might come across. It's everywhere upstate. It has a square stem like that. So if you take the stem and just roll it in your fingers, um, you'll feel it kind of like a uh, popped tire, you know, instead of a round stem where it'll just roll, you'll feel that square stem when you're looking at it. It's not always in flower, but when it is in flower, um, very easy to identify with that bright purple flower. It's, it's a beautiful looking plant, you know, it really is. Um, and additionally, it, it has hairs all along it as well. So you see the hairs along the stems, the leaves, the main stem here. Um, I know there's been talk, I know Andy has presented on it in the past of a, um, a cultivar that was supposedly sterile and would not reproduce the purple loose strife. But as far, at least Andy, last I heard you speak about it, um, studies have shown that is not the case. So you might see purple loose strife you sold as Lithrum virgatum, I believe is the, the species name, uh, sold at nurseries that can still have these invasive properties as purple loose strife, um, really invasive. It can really overtake, you know, wetland fringe habitats like this. Um, it actually has the ability to influence pH of the water body as well. So it could have some, some pretty significant impacts, um, you know, and should be a pretty easy one to ID once you come across it. But, you know, again, when it's not in flower, look for that the square stem, as well as the hairs along the, uh, the stem, and then the lancelet shaped leaves here as well. Um, yellow iris, so I touched on this one before as well. Uh, pretty common invasive, unfortunately, is used a lot um, for, for plantings and, you know, other projects as such. Um, 
yellow flower compared to the blue flower. It's a very easy way to tell it apart. I think someone said in the chat though before that another good way to distinguish between the two is that the yellow iris is a lot more rhizomatic um, and that has thicker rhizomes that really can just choke out waterways. And I've seen it even clog up streams and make its own natural dam, if you will. Um, so another one to keep an eye out for that you probably will come across while doing any aquatic surveys in the area. Uh, watercress, I'll leave that one to Yuri. <laughs> um, if you want to go see it, go to the Connectquat, you will come across it. Um, but it has these opposite leaves here, uh, compound leaves as well. Nice, pretty white flowers that you'll come across. Um, and just this growth pattern here that, you know, it'll come out of the water and just overtake the surface and almost, you know, grow out of the water body and grow off, you know, off the surface. Um, something I didn't mention with water chestnut as well, is that I've seen water chestnut grow almost six inches off of the water surface. So it just starts cupping up and then growing up more and more. It's uh, very thirsty for the sun, I guess you could say. Um, the watercress, here's another one. It's pretty common among island. I've seen it in some drainage ditches as well while going out to do some wetlands work. Um, and very well spread in the Connectquat River, as Yuri mentioned. Do we even have to go over Phragmites? Is <laughs> um, common read, Phragmites australis. I'm missing a parenthesis there, gotta fix that. Um, you know, if you haven't seen this plant, you're, or if you say you haven't seen this plant, I know you're lying to me. Um, it is everywhere. You know, a lot of us in here already know the ill effects of it. Um, crazy that it could grow on the side of the road like this. You know, it's te technically a wetland species, but I've seen it grow, you know, in upland habitats as well. Um, you can see just the dense stands that it makes and then the characteristic, uh, you know, fluffy seed head here that spreads tons of seeds, seeds um, making it very difficult to control. Just crazy deep, strong rhizomes with this plant as well. Um, you know, and that tall grass-like feature that we're also sadly familiar with. So just to go over kind of the stuff quickly about some of the impacts of aquatics. Again, I know I'm running short on time here, so I'll try to be quick. Um, there's also damage to the recreational economy besides just those ecological factors that we spoke about. Um, zebra mussels here, luckily there aren't any on Long Island. Again, as far as I know, um, it's probably because our waters don't have enough calcium in it to really support um, them forming their shells. But in upstate New York and the Catskills, um, at Seagull Lake, a lot of the Finger Lakes, zebra mussels are everywhere. They're very difficult to control because they're larvae, you know, hop onto boats, they're in boat water, whole water, attached on trailers, whatever it might be, and then easily get transported from water body to water body. Um, kind of interesting, I've seen while doing a lot of scuba diving work, zebra mussels growing on Eurasian water milfoil. Talk about that for a symbiotic relationship and you know just the, the picture for invasive species. You see these two growing on one another. Um, probably not gonna come across these in Lisma, but in the rest of New York state, you definitely will. Um, they have that zebra shaped, you know, striations on their, on their shell, um, usually pretty tiny, about yay big. Um, and a good way to ID them with a bunch of other muscles that you might come across is if you take them, they're almost like a D shape and they'll actually sit flat on a, on a table or a bench, whatever it is, and they won't topple over. So it's a good way to ID the zero muscles here. Um, very good at filtering out water. So a number of people kind of say that, you know, oh, wow, the water clarity in this water body has increased by six plus feet. I love it. I could go swimming now. It's so great for, you know, everything within the water. I could see fish in the water. Um, but what often happens is that you're increasing that light. It's going down to the bottom of the water body, which is then allowing more plants to then grow because you're increasing that photic zone. Um, you know, so the relationship between zebra mussels and a lot of these aquatic invasive plants, they, they benefit from one another. Um, also, they're, they're filter feeders, so they filter a lot of, you know, zooplankton or phytoplankton that are necessary for our native zooplankton or tiny fish um, to really be feeding on. So they kind of just eat up everything that those, those species would be feeding on normally. Round goby, one of the worst invasive fish. Um, it's a very tiny fish, so it doesn't really get a lot of recognition. Um, not like the snakehead, it's not that nice poster child, but 
very common in the St. Lawrence Seaway um, and in the St. Lawrence River up there. They are voracious egg eaters. So what they really do, and I, if I'm not mistaken, has a big um, impact on pike populations within the St. Lawrence River. Um, they go ahead and just eat a, a bunch of eggs, you know, so like I said, they're voracious egg eaters. They'll eat up all these eggs and it's kind of just led to a terrible trophic cascade of um, very poor recruitment of a lot of native fish. And when that happens, you know, you're sending the aquatic environment into just a total top-down, um, you know, top-down disaster uh, in regards to just, you know, no recruitment of younger fish to grow up into our trophy sized fish, um, you know, and it's impacting the fishery and not just the ecological community of these water bodies. I mean, zebra mussels, it could damage infrastructure too. I've done diving for this on Otsego Lake where you send, um, we called it a pig while doing it. It's just basically a big flotation device with um, metal spikes on it to just scrape out zebra mussels on intake pipes for, you know, whatever they might be used, whether it's water supply, um, or anything like that, but just the fact that they can grow within these pipes once they get in there and clog up these water intake pipes um, costs a lot of money, you know, in the United States, a lot <laughs> um, in damages that they, they can cause uh, throughout the year. And I believe they've been found on the Hoover Dam now. Um, I think I read that somewhere, you know, so that's a big, very important dam uh, out there that they're causing damage to that infrastructure. So you could just, you know, imagine the number of ways that these could impact uh, our lives. And besides all that, they hurt. Um, I've had this happen to me where I've gotten cut on a zebra mussel. They're very, very sharp. You've done it while diving or even just swimming. You know, you're swimming along, you just, your hand goes down low and you just get a huge cut on your hand because of how sharp they are. Um, you know, so it's interesting just the number of ways that they can really impact us uh, in our environment. Okay, so to quickly wrap up, um, resources for, for you guys out there trying to ID anything. Like I said, you can contact me with a picture, um, you know, put stuff in IMAP and bases to let some other folks like myself or other people confirm what you think you may have found. Um, DC as always is a great resource for it, uh, for any ID. Through the Looking Glass is probably my favorite ID book to recommend. It's very um, informative for experts or people who know a lot, as well as just someone who wants to get more interested or involved with aquatic plants. Um, this, and it also has this, this awesome illustration on the, the cover page. Um, it has great illustrations throughout the book, though. It goes through a lot of the ecology of all the plants um, and other identifying characteristics. So I'd highly recommend this book. I believe it's like $30 on Amazon. It's good to have on you at all times. Um, and then the real deal kind of aquatic plant ID book is this aquatic and wetlands plant uh, uh, book here by Crow and Hellquist. That is, like I said, just really the, um, probably as far as I know, the best uh, ID book out there. There's two volumes of it as well. Uh, so volume one and two um, in terms of IDing any of these plants. So if you'd like to reach out to me, I'll try to um, go through any questions I see in the chat quickly if we have time, Bill. If not, I'd be glad to just, you know, shoot me an email. Uh, I take a screenshot of my contact info here. Um, you know, so I got my email and cell phone number as well. Um, I'd be glad to answer any other additional questions or, you know, just discuss anything in general in terms of aquatic plants. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Does anybody have any questions if we do have some time still? Well, thank you very much, Luke. If if you can stay for a few minutes on your own, if you can see the chat and maybe answer some questions in the chat, and then we'll go ahead and start with Mitchell too. Absolutely, yeah, that's totally that'd be right. great. Thank you. That was a great presentation, Luke. And uh, if He's anybody wants to see water chestnut up close, I saw June six through twelve. Get in touch with Ashley Morris of DEC, or get in touch with us at Lisma. And we'll give you the dates and the times. And uh, yeah, that was great, Luke. I I always need a refresher every year on aquatic invasives. So that was very helpful. Yeah, they, they're, they're tough to ID. And usually when I give this talk, I like to have a bunch of samples in the back of the room so that we could actually uh, get our hands dirty and look at some of them and go over that stuff. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do it now, but 
it's a good way to you know always practice the things right in front of you so yeah and the field guides too thank you for that i'm, I'm never sure what's a good field guide so i'm gonna grab through the one. looking glass is great like i said for you know lake managers like myself or you know anyone who just wants to get their their feet wet um it's a it's a great idea book and i highly recommend it all right great thank you luke yeah. all right great job